think for now is uh, Dr. John Hink and Dr. Robert Hink and their colleague, colleague uh, Derek Ibaneko uh, from the Air University, and they're going to be looking at practical practicing ethical leadership in a decision making framework. Jenna, thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Colonel Derek Carmenko. I'm the Vice Commandant over at uh, Officer Training School at Air University. Of course, joined by my colleague, Dr. John Hink, and his nephew, Dr. Robert Hink, not able to join us. Uh, is he in virtual? No, he's teaching. All right. But uh, absolutely a, a co conspirator for, uh, for what we're about to present this morning. You should guys joke, given that I'm an Air Force officer and understand the terrain that I am in, um, and I do not have the high ground. I'm not going to attempt to joke here, so we're just going to jump right. And given how we respond to that, it's a good thing I didn't start with you. All right, here's what we're going to talk about. All right, there we go. A little bit more light. So there's our overview. We're going to talk about this ethical leadership decision making framework that's been developed. So we're actually going to practice this. We're going to put this into application, something that we're very keen to do. We're going to get some reps, as, as we just talked about. We'll go through two scenarios. You guys will have to look at work this morning. Then, then we'll look at uh, connecting the experiences to the research findings, and we'll close it. All right, so here's that first example. We're going to jump right into this. So here we go, mission first for people always. What would you do in this situation? Person on your command that failed to complete the safety checklist, violated that mandatory, mandatory safety protocol, caught it before any type of damage to equipment or bodies were done. But the reason that they skipped this mandatory checklist item, the safety item, was the counsel of fellow individual uh, suicidal intentions. So what I'm going to ask everybody to do very briefly, it's going to take about a minute to do this. Pair it up. Sitting at a table with someone that's next to you, please pair it up. Discuss what would you do? It's the key concept. And if you're not at a table with somebody, uh, with another individual, turn around, go to a brief degree. But what would you do here? And then we're briefly going to quickly outbreak for this. So what would you do in this situation? For <laughs> those of you that are in the virtual and that are joining us on team, you would have your answer on the chat. I have a guy on the team up there. An individual answer. How did you go about attacking this? all right so as we kind of wrap up these discussions and what you will do i'm going to ask anybody here would like to share Briefly, what would you do in this situation? Is there any group here that's compelled to share? What would you do? What would be the main focus? How would you attack this problem very hard today? Anybody like to share before I call on somebody? Just raise your hand. Nobody wants to attack this problem and share. Okay, I'm going to ask everybody. So I'm going to ask everybody right now if we could just. Cease the discussion again, very briefly. Hey, how would we attack this, sir? If you could, how, how would you get at this? Uh, number one, I would make sure that person with suicidal intentions was uh, doing well and being taken care of appropriately. Uh, and then I would recognize that that intent probably an immediate need and congratulate the student for whatever it is uh, for doing that. But then I have a discussion on you know what else could have been done to ensure that the safety protocols followed. So I'm not sure this was a uh, not sure this was uh, as challenging. Maybe it was your first example here, so you're giving us a fairly easy one. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely right. We'll crawl, walk, run, um, and again, given I'm an Air Force officer, I don't want to come in too aggressive here. But yeah, no, it's kind of a softball. 
it's interesting. How would you hold the individual accountable? What's the accountability factor, right? Safety checklist, discipline, uh, checklist discipline, right? Something that could have missed something that could have killed somebody, but in doing so, trying to help somebody potentially, they're potentially trying to save a life, right? So it's a it's a complex situation, although you say, oh, it's kind of easy. How would you hold the people accountable? What would be those second, third order effects in your institution, your organization? Your organization, if you simply praise, praise, and you don't hold someone accountable for missing a man's word, check this side, right? Just good, good discussion. And that's kind of gets it kind of gets into what we're going to cover today with the framework, the need for the framework. So a genesis for creating this framework for students who attend our eight day leader development course. Right. So it is uh, the leader development course for squadron commanders. It's essentially a two week course. It's AU's highest rated course. Uh, my colleague would uh, wanted me to make sure I threw that plug in there. But it's where uh, they it's a deliberate development for squadron commanders for those that are just a little bit left of bang, as we like to say, before they go into squadron command. This course really focuses on the human domain. It's uh, two weeks, week one application, week two, or excuse me, week one is theory, and then week two, we kind of get to the application. The application, and you see the discipline and justice that's circled up there. Through those discipline and justice scenarios, case study scenarios, we had noticed there was a need from student feedback of some type of framework to work through these decisions. How do we get to what the right answer is, or at least a better yes? It's, it, it's hard, right? So really the genesis work, how do we develop the framework, giving give a tool to the students so that they can progress through these complex scenarios. At the same time, Air University, looking at their quality effectiveness plan, has had a concerted effort in trying to get after ethical capacity. Loosely, they've used the self team and organization uh, to focus on getting after ethical capacity. So, developing oneself, developing then the teams, and then, of course, those effects on the organization. You overlay that with then the Air Force, you have the airmen, which is the individual leaders of teams or leader of airmen. So, you think that's the team piece, think of those in leadership positions, or command teams, that type of functionality. You couple those together and then there are facts overall, overall in the institution. So we believe the framework that's developed, this ethical leadership decision making framework aligns um, really well with AU's all attempts to get after ethical capacity. And I will go through this slide here and just transition to this. So when we look at what's been developed through this agent act and outcome, that's where you, you start to see the alignment with the ethical capacity. So the agent, the individual, the act, right? That's uh, effect of the team, if you will, and then the outcome, the effect on the institution. So we look at the agent frame, right? This is dealing with those virtual ethics. So looking at the the individual from an aspect of how they're helping others, what their motives were, their intentions, the overall character of self, the act. What focus, the act really focuses on the duties. So the duties, the obligations, and the regulations that one must follow. And then the outcome. We talk about unintended or overarching effects of the outcome. So now you're trying to provide a framework where you look at the individual, what they did, and then the outcome of what they did. I go back to this slide, agent frame. So a person of good character, high performing individual, they make a one time decision or a one-time mistake. They had good intentions, so you decide not to highly punish or lightly punish involvement in those situations, right? Um, could be someone of 15 years of decorated service, high character individual, they make a, a one-time mistake, you go a little lighter. A little lighter as far as the discipline is concerned. The act frame, the person violating a policy regardless of their intentions or quality of character, you decide to punish because the rule exists and must be followed. Safety checklist must be followed. How do you act? In the outcome frame, there's a good example. First violated a small rule policy, but because the organization has this consistent uh, or reoccurring problem, consistent history of that one problem occurring, you decide to go a little bit heavier as far as the job, the, the discipline that you hand out. We're going to now put this back into application with a little bit, a little bit tougher situations. So we go back to this softball of an example, a person in your command, right? What was the act? They violated the procedure. What was the outcome? In this case, no harm to mission. The agent, they have good intentions. It would drive you to a decision. It, 
provides a framework to make to potentially make a better decision. All right, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Hank. He's going to walk, we'll walk you through these scenarios. We'll work together on these scenarios, but again, we'll uh, we'll team up and we'll try to figure out how would we attack this using agent, act, and frame or outcome. Excuse me. So within that framework, can we identify what the agent the agent, who the agent was, what were their virtues, the acts, rules that they followed, the, 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 the checklist, if you will, and then the outcome, what were the intended or unintended consequences, or what are the unintended consequences or intended consequences of this? So the agent, the act, and the outcome. John, I'll turn it over to you. I'll turn it over to you. I don't know if I set that up for you. Awesome. Thank you, Nico. Um, hey, a shout out to uh, friends who are in here that I served with years ago. Mike uh, Posey, it's great to see you. He's a brigade through his battalion three in Korea. Cameron Gallagher, former commander of the first of the 501st attack battalion. It's good to see my friend. I miss flying with you in the backseat of that Apache. Um, this whole framework, you're seeing the end of the sausage making process. So we have a slide later on that's going to go a little bit more of the methodology and that kind of stuff, but we, we really want to show you the framework and then get into the scenarios. I want to connect uh, something that Major General Hill said earlier along with Colonel Bullis. Um, General Hill talked about sharing our best practices, and this is one of them. We have two other presentations, one later today on post-mention intelligence, and then one tomorrow on coaching using uh, listening latitudes. So we're, we're really trying to emphasize that sharing of best practices. And then second, what Dr. Bullis said earlier, Leader development is a competitive advantage. Certainly, we, we wholeheartedly agree with that, that premise. In the, uh, the course that we teach, the leader development course for Squadron Command, our students are wrestling with how you want us to make a decision on just an injustice yet. We don't really know how to make a decision. That, that was sort of an insight for us, taking their data from the end of course surveys. So we created this framework. You're seeing now one of the scenarios that we use with our students. And so, like uh, Nico invited you before, please turn back to that person next to you. Finish reading this. If you're in the room, you actually have uh, an example or a, uh, a handout that shows the ethical leadership decision making framework. And then just have that discussion. Is it which frame? How would you solve this, this situation? Are you more influenced by the Agent frame, act frame, or outcome, or maybe there's two frames that are competing toward how you make a decision. So we'll give that, and if you're in uh, teams, um, please go ahead and put in the chat some of your answers as well. We'll reconvene or come back in about three minutes. Thank you. Wait, wait, but
Thank you for your discussions. I was able to attend two of the uh, small group discussions. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on which frame you used to look at this situation and make a decision, whether it was the act, outcome, agent frame, or a combination of those two. Who would like to share their thoughts? They're going to hang them at noon. Sunrise, sunrise. Hang them at sunrise. Hang them at sunrise. What was behind that uh, statement, hang them at sunrise? Get better pictures of sunrise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, would that have been more of the um, that type of decision connected more to the agent actor outcome friend? Outcome. Yeah. Thank you. By, by show of hands, how many thought this decision was more influenced by the outcome friend? Anyone by the act frame? Yeah. So we're going to go to you two gentlemen and then in the back, just like to hear what, what are your thoughts on how the act frame was used in seeing this? Yes, sir. See you down in person. Um, so for us, the act frame was part of it too. I mean, it, we leaned on outcome first, but act is also part of it. There are duties and obligations that these, these young, uh, young airmen had that they violated, right? So, um, that feeds into the outcome, so they're related. And then you can talk agent too. That they're that the other two were took precedence. I mean, they're all interrelated. Yeah. In fact, that's a lot. What our students say. There's generally not one frame. It's generally two. So we appreciate you sharing that. And folks in the back, just like to hear your thoughts on that before you move to uh, hearing anyone on the teams. Okay, yeah, so we were primarily focused on the outcome uh, side of this because in the military, uh, in, in, when we're looking at this, that, that one of the most important things that we do day in and day out is to build and engender trust that the American people have in our institution. And so sometimes our sailors, airmen, and, and soldiers can potentially act in, in accordance with or, or not contrary to policy, law, et cetera, but they can still damage that trust that, that the Americans have in us. And in my opinion, this crosses that line. While looking at this, they didn't violate any law, statute, or policy. So not really from an act point of view, but from an outcome point of view, it's clear that they're behavior negatively impacted the trust the Americans had in us, potentially. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, they may have violated, um, you know, some type of social media policy, maybe. And oftentimes our students bring that up. Um, love that you brought up the idea of trust. So we also connect this particular session to a session later on in, in week two on trust, empowerment, and innovation. We would connect it back to values as well and, and other decision making. Um, thank you for that. Anyone from Teams? Like to share with with uh, what they thought nothing in there. Okay, we're going to skip scenario two. Similar to that, we would ask you the same thing. But it's uh, it'll be provided in the slide deck. Um, student feedback. Um, what we found is our students at the end said stuff like, like "Now I understand how we can see the situation through the three three frames." It's a little bit more sticky, if you will. And then in terms of the uh, uh, literate scales, they, they felt it was extremely helpful, very helpful in, in making decisions. I'm going to skip this. You can see it. Article was just published by Wild Blue Yonder, a used online journal. And some implications for PME to kind of wrap this up. And uh, I think it's time to go to any questions.
I'm seeing your hands raised in here. Anything in Teams? Okay. <clears throat> By the way, I, I, it's it's not really a question, perhaps a comment. Uh, one of the things that great that the scenario that we took a look at race for me was uh, the concept of principles, and again, I kept as I was reading the scenario, <clears throat> I kept having the voice of a prior commander years ago um, who inculcated the principle. To me, you were always on duty. You were never off duty, and I know that's a particular problem, particularly in in, in terms of character development with IGN and Gen Z. So I don't. I would have located this within the agent frame and that invocation of that principle. I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, yeah great point. So in that example, um, maybe the dancing is not that big of a deal because maybe they didn't post what someone else posted without their permission. But definitely riding in the scooters. Probably not the right principle to show, especially to uh, to an American or minor nation. So yeah, oftentimes these discussions then elicit going back to the foundations um, that we call um, clarity of purpose and some other stuff that we use in our course. But definitely the, the principle based leadership. Thank you. One of the thing in terms of applicability, I, I like one of the things that you said earlier in the presentation that your students come to see through this model that there are these are not mutually exclusive types of lenses in which to enact ethical decision making, but they often see two to three of these at least at play in every uh, type of scenario. And, and that's a level of education in terms of ethical development that, that we all seek, to, I think, to get our students to um, to be able to integrate some of these things and to hold them in tension with, with, with one of them. One of them. Great. OK, do we have any other questions from those in the room or uh, online that have come up? Okay. It's uh, thank you, gentlemen, very much. Oh, wait a minute, we have one. Uh, Dr. Bolt is correct. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is kind of built on what you just said. I'm wondering how you have the conversation with your students about uh, in your model if one of those components suggests a certain behavior of reinforcement and another component of the model says no there ought to be punishment associated with this um when the components of your model suggest very different and competing responses by the leader can you just talk a little bit about how you how you have that conversation yeah so actually our students are put into a hot seat so in our course we have sort of four flavors of students those who are back to you in command about three years prior so it can range from captains to majors to lieutenant colonels, depending on their yeah, AFSC. Um, we also then have uh, civilians, spouses, and a senior enlist generally rank, uh, so E7 and E9. We'll put a commander and a enlisted together, so they act as a command team. One thing we want to drive home is, although they get 15 minutes to make a decision in the scenario, what they learn is, don't make this decision alone. So that's one. Two, what are your options that are UCMJ, especially if it's not judicial punishment? What would you do? Would you take rank or take pay and then suspend it? So those kinds of discussions come up as well in terms of what options do they have? Thank you. Right, um, if you have any other questions, we're just at a time banner. That's our contact information. We'll be around uh, throughout the, the entire forum. So really, thanks for your participation and have a great rest of the day.